Committee, Dick, it's great talk. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce <coughs> Dick Hokinson. Uh, he's got a, had a very distinguished career at a string of uh, blue chip uh, economic financial companies, uh, Data Resources Inc., uh, Merrill Lynch, uh, Donaldson, Donaldson, Lufkin, Jenrett, and uh, then Credit Suisse. First Boston in 2002, he started his own firm, so for 10 years he's been an entrepreneur, he loves entrepreneurs, but I guess you sacrificed your entrepreneurial position now. And he's become managing director at ISI uh, Institute for Strategy and Investment, one of, one of the most distinguished uh, such research groups in the U.S. It's in New York. So let me, uh, with further, no further ado, bring up a real cheerleader for the U.S. economy. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My principal focus today is going to be on investment issues. <clears throat> you can put your pens away if you want. There's nothing I'm going to tell you that you need to do today in some sense. But I'm playing out the issue of the you know, famous quote from David Foote, the famous Canadian demographer, says demographics explains 70% of everything. It's a question of identifying the headwinds and the tailwinds, the basic trends, the secondary trends, and recognizing what are cycles for our trends and what are reversals of trends. And, that's it. and the point I would stress at the outset, which we hopefully come away from my session with, is the recognition and realization that you're making operating decisions, investment decisions, in a world that is structurally and fundamentally different from the past. We've not been here before. I know in the financial world, the form is dangerous, whereas it can be this time, it's different. But demographically, the world is different. Because for the first time ever in the history of the planet, we have a situation where generations are not replacing themselves in the population pool, having more brothers and sisters and children. Planet Earth is aging. Not just the aging that we speak about in terms of Japan, Europe, the US. Second fastest aging country is China. And of course, Peter made an important point before. I mean, Japan got rich before it got old. I think it's high rich. China gets old before it gets rich. <clears throat> but the most important investment related conclusion is that an aging planet crushes inflation. I'm bullish on the real things, real growth, productivity, and so on. But an aging planet crushes inflation because supply curves are shifting up faster than the demand curves. So all the nominal things, interest rates, earnings, are under enormous pressure. I'm bullish on the real things. I'm just very bearish or negative amount of inflation. And if you want to think about what's one of the most important things you have to make a decision on in terms of how you do asset allocations and so on, it's what is the output of inflation. The vast majority of, of Americans or people in the world believe inflation is going to tick up. Right? QE1, QE2, maybe QE3, European Central Bank, and so on. Pretty tons of money. What's the bank of Japan? Well, I'll say collapse. I can print it. But I can't make this man. So, <clears throat> this is the master checker. <clears throat> These are just some illustrations <clears throat> in terms of you know how many years of declining birth rates, but also declining <clears throat> death rates that take for various countries. You know, population of the elderly with double. The France 115, U.S. 70. You know, Japan 26. Boom. I mean, birth rates are falling the fastest in the developing world. The fact that the basic catalyst of change in terms of declining birth rates globally is educational enfranchisement for women. Betty Friday was right. As women have education, economic opportunities, and economic opportunities, birth rates fall. And if you want to think about catalysts of change going forward, consider the following set of facts. In Saudi Arabia today, there are more women enrolled in college than men. The same is true for Iran. Iran already has a birth rate that is below replacement. When Boeing sells a 747 to Saudi Air, it has twice as many restrooms in business class as any other configuration. Because literally, as the plane leaves Riyadh, when we grab their cosmetic cases, run the laboratory, strip off the bias, they're in Western dress. They're not going back. 
most popular television show in Saudi Arabia is Oprah, Empowered Black Woman. And two months ago, we hit a major milestone. Because starting two months ago, it is now possible for Saudi women to be employed in a lingerie store. We talk about the, you know, the Arab Spring, you know, what's going on in Libya, Tunisia, in Egypt, Bahrain, and so on. There's another Arab Spring that's happening in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and the Emirates, which is a huge increase in the divorce rate. It's now 20% in Saudi Arabia, it is 37% in Kuwait. That's a massive shift. And that's why the Taliban is such an issue. So when the Taliban goes in, they pull the girls out of school. If you want to keep them barefoot and pregnant, you've got to keep them done. Right? That's the fault line, right? That's Afghanistan, it's Pakistan, and it's northern India for different. This is the UN forecast of 10 billion. <laughs> it is done under the very curious and unsubstantiated assumption that birth rates, which are below replacement for 46% of the world's population today, will miraculously increase to replacement levels. <clears throat> birth rates, which are falling in the emerging and <clears throat> frontier economies like Africa, will get to a full fall to a replacement level, but then won't decline any further. But the key point is, I think fertility falls faster, but the key point I would stress is, no matter what forecast you use, the growth rate of the world's population is slowing. The debate here is how fast we get to zero. The debate is not, do we accept it? Global birth rate peaked in 1971 at five children per week with age. It's below 2.5 now. <clears throat> Richard talked about Africa before. <clears throat> I was <clears throat> I did the first ever CFA Institute tour of Africa last October. And there's some very interesting things happening. At some point this decade, we will have to confront what do we do about Africa? What do we think about it? It's one in every three new workers in the world. And the question is, does Africa become its own standalone country, a manufacturing power or whatever? Or does Africa become a source of emigres to the regions of the world like Europe and so on that need, need immigrants? It's a somewhat open question. But some very interesting things that are happening. I mean, only 20% of Kenya is urbanized. But as Richard pointed out earlier, the fastest, urban, fastest pace of urbanization is taking place, is taking place in Africa. 70% of Kenya has a secondary, of the adult population has a secondary tertiary education. And the basic drive in terms of economic development is do I get an increased concentration of smart people? And then I get all kinds of productivity spillovers. <clears throat> okay, never underestimate the power of baby boomers. Okay? When baby boomers were young, okay, so here's an increase in share of baby boomers. <clears throat> when almost all of their income stream were wages and salaries, they stuck it to the old with much higher capital gains tax rates. Well, how else would you put that? I mean, I stuck it to the old folks, okay? <laughs> now, as baby boomers age, as more of their income stream becomes capital, they stick it to the young. They favor themselves in terms of lower capital gains tax rates. <clears throat> and they stick to the young in terms of FICA taxes. More than 80% of all households in America pay more in FICA taxes than they do in federal income taxes. <clears throat> we talk home. Oh, <clears throat> that's the big issue here, right? The biggest investment conclusion is it's the ratio to zero for interest rates globally. Japan is winning that race. It's not necessarily the race one wants to win. 
it depends on where you are, right? If you were a borrower, <coughs> or a asset, et cetera. So this is, <coughs> so just to set it up here, here's the yield on your long-term trends. Here's the smooth growth in <coughs> current dollar GDP. And as far as I know, I'm one of the few, if not the only economists on Wall Street that ever looked at current dollar GDP. You'll never find this in discussions in Wall Street Journal, the Barons, or Business Week. There, the focus is always about real or inflation-adjusted GDP. But I've yet to find any company that reports real or inflation-adjusted earnings. And with the exception of tips, no company issues dimensions with real or inflation-adjusted coupons. It's a nominal world. <clears throat> so, the key point here is over time, these are not two separate variables. They're one and the same. Nominal GDP is actual real growth plus actual inflation. Long-term interest rate is expected real growth plus expected inflation. <clears throat> and in short time intervals, I will get deviations or differences that give me enough time <coughs> to purchase. <clears throat> so then the question is, what causes nominal GDP? And the answer is labor force. If you do a supply side decomposition of nominal GDP in terms of population, participation rates, hours work, employment rates, productivity compensation, and so on, this is the relationship that you end up with. And the way to think about this is okay, baby boomers are maturing as young adults here. Huge increase in number of people moving out of their parents' home and their shared living services and beginning their own household life. Making huge demands at the same time the workforce becomes younger and less experienced. You want to think about it in terms of basic microeconomics, demand curves are shifting out faster than supply curves. It's inflation. But what happens with baby as baby boomers age? The growth rate of demand is slowing. But we're older, and more productive, more efficient. So now supply curves are shifting out faster than demand curves. The world we're in is structurally disinflationary. Mm. Labor force growth forecast. Mm. It continues to slow. Baby boomers that reach a retirement age and smaller cohorts of entry. It does not repeat, not ever turn negative. The U.S. is one of the few countries in the world that can say in the year 2050 it has a growing population and a growing workforce. Certainly no other developed country can say that. Mm. But you continue to pull interest rates in a downward direction. Okay. And yes, there are cycles. We get faster economic growth this year or next. Bond market vigilantes will certainly be out in force. <clears throat> Bond yields will go up. But you should view that. There's a great, another great buying opportunity. Keep one of my stress here. This chart makes me persona non grata with every pension plan in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> they are hoping, praying, that QE1 and QE2 and LTROs and so on will work, and I'll get six and seven percent treasuries, and I can fund my liabilities straight and sleep well at night. And it's not going to happen. They're mostly now in a state of denial. They are the deer in the headlights. At some point, they will throw the towel down. They will say, we can't make it. We're big gunners and fixed big gunners. It's just not generating on that returns. And then you can see massive asset allocation shifts take place. <coughs> Okay, the basic trend is in the developed world is aging, right? <clears throat> so this is Northern Western Europe, North America, Japan, Australia, New Zealand. 12% of the world's population, about 65% of world GDP. So what you're looking at here then is this enormous rotation in the consumption level from goods <coughs> towards experiences. Young people buy goods, they move out of their parents' house. They need all the stuff to buy goods. They start a family, they buy tough stuff for their kids. Then they get older. And then they say, stuff I have is good enough. 
And what I want to do to enrich my life is this weekend have a nice dinner with my significant other, a nice bottle of wine, a nice concert, etc. My experiences I have just been the obvious in terms of financial services and healthcare. Apple is an experience. Starbucks is an experience. Okay, so these are headwinds, with the exception of the US. It's no surprise that the global financial crisis had such a major negative impact on manufactured consumer goods. Because with the exception of America, I have very little demand. Somebody asked a question a while back, why are we selling fewer cars in Germany? The answer, fewer drivers. It's not rocket science, okay? Your European car makers face a major headwind. There's a decline number of people who can drive a car. It's a simple fact. And the last time you can somehow convince people to buy own more than one car at a time, you're looking at least at 20% over capacity. It's going to be a market share fight. I'm not saying you don't ever invest in the European car manufacturer, but, the, but you don't invest because it's a tailwind. You might sign the tailwind. Oh, I'll have an expanding number of drivers. That's a tailwind. Here's the population pyramid for Japan. <clears throat> Some people have said it looks like a continent. <laughs> but there's an important lesson to be drawn from Japan. Japan represents the dark side of the aging population, which is you get stuck in chronic inflation and you never get out. But there's another critical aspect to think about. An aging society is also labor intensive. And the equivalent of nurses' aides and orderlies and so on and turn people in beds, wheel them in wheelchairs. Japan recognizes that need, but instead of importing nurses from the Philippines, they're trying to build robots. <clears throat> a while back, Panasonic announced, we have built a robot that washes people's hair. I don't know that Japan will be successful in building robots <clears throat> that can turn people in people's beds, build them in wheelchairs, and so on, but to the extent that they are, su are successful, the entire aging world benefits. So one of the things we always worry about is, you know, the cost of health care <clears throat> and so on. <clears throat> Europe aging faster than we are, not as fast as Japan. <clears throat> Here's an interesting picture. Here's Europe in the year 2000, 1960. So the youngest countries were Southern Europe, the Eastern Bloc. But by 2060, the youngest countries are now Scandinavia, UK, France, Belgium, and Holland. <clears throat> because birth rates are collapsing <clears throat> faster in southern and eastern European countries. And I'll leave you with another nugget about the Euro. Okay? I mean, Merkel and Sarkozy, they're still kicking the can down the road. We're going to still confront that issue. But push comes to shove, it survives for the following simple reason Germany is 1% of world population. They are 9% of world exports. If Germany had a standalone currency, depreciation in what would have been the DMAR would have been so great it would have crippled their export industries. Germany has an enormous vested interest in tying itself to weak systems. The Greeks of the world, the Portugals and so on, the import dependent countries. So push comes to shove, the euro survives. <clears throat> Long-term issue is Turkey. <clears throat> 80 million people. <clears throat> you know, the pyramid looks like a pyramid. <clears throat> France, especially European Union, but France especially has been playing hardball in terms of these are the things, all the reforms that Turkey needs to make. The Turkey patient latest come to the conclusion to say, look, the reality is you need us more than we need you. So stop it. <laughs> the American exception is the American birth rate, 2.1 children per woman. It's the highest in the developed world, plus immigration. The key point about immigration is not just the numbers. It's that America attracts the risk takers. I lived outside the United States for the last eight years. 
One of the things that happens when you live outside your country of origin, you get a different perspective on things. It's called the American dream. And maybe it sounds very corny, but it's not. No one emigrates to Holland, Germany, Denmark, UK, with the notion of getting rich. They go for a job from Turkey or Northern Africa or whatever. People come here with the notion that they can get rich, that they can make it. And I realize not many do. And we pay a very good price in terms of poverty. But we attract the risk takers. And I hope any immigration bill that we ever get will continue to focus on that. And think about it. Who is the ultimate risk taker? The illegal. The risk of lives. <clears throat> OK, here's the headwind tailwind of the US. I've got two tailwinds. Baby boom is approaching retirement. Oops. And the echo baby boom, entering ages of household formation and so on. This is where you have rising demand for goods. <clears throat> Financial crisis had a negative impact on the rate of household formation. <clears throat> it bounced back. I think housing is going to be surprised at upside this year and next in terms of uh, finding how strong it becomes. <clears throat> There's another important change. <clears throat> the divorce rate is now falling in America. An industry that is negatively impacted by this are toys. For toys, almost the least significant issue is how many children are there. Remember, children don't buy toys. Adults do. Well, so what counts is how many adults are children related to? How many gift givers are there? The toy industry really benefited from the breakdown in the social mosaic for the maturation of the baby especially the sharp increase in the divorce rate. Because what the marriage, divorce, remarriage, merry-go-round did was to explode the universe of gift givers. The apex of that was a child born in Atlanta, Georgia, 1990, came into this world with 16 sets of grandparents. God knows how many aunts and uncles. I mean, after we leave any gift given in case that household involved at least a small truck. <laughs> now the divorce rate's falling. Yes, it's true. Children today have more likely to have surviving grandparents and great grandparents and so on. But you're no longer sort of exploring, exploring that universe. <clears throat> Here's total population, US versus Eurozone. Here's working age population. Okay? So I think an issue that we will see more and more happen that was not touched on by prior speakers, it's called insourcing. It's companies moving production back to America. It's happening at an accelerating pace. Now, we're a private equity firm in New York. One of their portfolio companies has moved production from China back to Michigan. Michigan now becomes the low-cost producer. Total low-cost, right? You're paying more for workers in Michigan, but you're also getting better out. People forget the level of productivity in China is pretty visible. The average Chinese worker has $6,000 worth of physical capital versus $150,000 in the U.S. and $250,000 in Japan. In 1970, when the U.S. was still in apparel power, <clears throat> the average worker in America could make 40 shirts in one day. The best the average worker can do in China today is 27. Part of the productivity problem in China is very high turnover rates, 60% turnover rates. For any of you who run companies or whatever, working companies, what would your company look like if every year you had to hire 60% of everyone? Okay. And this is why Maserati will now build cars in Michigan. <laughs> Here's the pyramid, you know, the shape of the pyramid becomes more normally shaped once the baby boomers die off. It's true, we become permanently older, but I'm relatively sanguine in the outlook of Social Security. Because the key issue here is gerontophobia, the fear of getting old. It's the fear of Alzheimer's. Baby boomers are going kicking and screaming in old age. They're not going quietly like their parents. 
your approach at retirement age, you can look at the actual payroll example and say, I can say, I expect them to have 19 years, is it 19 quality years? I don't know, I have Alzheimer's, but I have a major negative impact on my loved ones. And what the Alzheimer's research clearly shows is use it or lose it. The more accurate you stay mentally and physically, the less likely you are to develop it, or if you do, it will be less severe. So now it's an incentive to transition out. And that is what we're seeing. We're seeing increasing participation rates for men and women over the age of 65. And it's not because they need the money. It's not because their 401ks became 101ks. Mm -hmm. Only a small minority say, I'm working because I have to, I need money. Almost everybody says, I'm working because I want to remain productive, I want to remain useful, engaged. So I'm relatively sanguine that Social Security, it, you know, for the financing and pickup time of cost of labor, it's not going to be as big an issue as people fear. Because if people work longer, you save a bundle of money. I, can, I unfortunately I can't say this anything about health care. <coughs> Just some quick. <coughs> okay, if Russia were Catholic, you would call on the priest to give it less rights. <laughs> <laughs> Until very recently, you had 750,000 more Russians dying every year than being born. <clears throat> Russian men are twice as likely to die as the father generation, women 60% higher. <clears throat> Number of entry levels of workers is collapsing. <clears throat> but this has another interpretation. This is also the pool of recruits for the army. There's an issue here. And I would appreciate your comments, Richard, later. Will there be enough men available for Russia to be able to field an army to defend itself? Remember, Russia has no natural borders, no mountain ranges, no rivers. We have the oceans, right? We see you coming. <laughs> it's a lake. It is a huge advantage, okay? <laughs> China, uh, fast, second fastest aging country, the decline there has nothing, repeat, nothing to do with the one child policy. Whatever impact the one child policy might have had in 1979, even that's very dubious, it no longer has an impact. You're overwhelmed by the social economics. Urbanization is on, but more especially, you are now overwhelmed by a big decline in the marriage rate and a big increase in the divorce rate. And in Asia, women who are not married do not have children. End of story. That's why Asia has such a high abortion rate. So I'm of opinion China can reverse the one-job policy tomorrow and find out nothing happens. Just like you saw in Singapore. But there's a big difference. I mean, Singapore given, has a third lowest birth rate in the world. They've given up. They've, you know, they have all kinds of policies to stimulate birth rates. They pay baby bonuses, they subsidize the importation of household health, the tax system that gives bigger deductions to larger families, they sponsor singles cruises, and sex education courses for married couples. But Singapore has basically said, well, we'll import our way out. And you can do that. You need four and a half million people, you can import your way out. I don't think that's a great option for China. <clears throat> Uh, they hit the wall by 2015 in terms of the number of people working in Asia. And here's an interesting issue. They're not very old today, but they age super fast. Consider the following. All of the non-petrodollar sovereign wealth funds in the world are age-based. <coughs> Governor Singapore Investment Corporation, Temps, foreign exchange reserves of China, Japan, and so on. What you're looking at are, in my opinion, are countries saving for retirement. What does it mean for a country to retire? What does it mean for China or Japan or whatever to contemplate today? I will have many retirees not producing. I don't have enough producers, and I have to import from the rest of the world. I better have saved some money in the meantime. China says they have three trillion in foreign exchange reserves. It is not enough money. It's about two thousand dollars per Chinese. The interesting question is going to be when, not if, but when, 
does China announce we have 10 trillion in foreign exchange? And how do we recycle that? Remember, it's always good for a one point drop in the bond market that somebody whispers, well, what happens if Japan or China sells or US treasuries? And your response should be, what the hell are they buying? They are willing investors. India, you know, birth rates are falling there, but only recently. Now we're entry level workers rising. India, however, finds another way to complicate its life. For every dollar spent on education in India, 85% of that dollar is spent at the university or college level. And so the Indian labor force then becomes, is comprised of a very different group versus everybody, almost everybody else. It's a small cadre of very well educated, very well trained workers, and a big pool of semi literate and illiterate workers. It's why, in my opinion, India never becomes a manufacturing powerhouse. They go straight to services, from agricultural services, as we're seeing. But what it also means is India becomes a nation of a few haves and many have nots. And they're not have nots because they're suppressed or oppressed, it's because they don't know any different. Brazil's sort of my favorite. <clears throat> the difference between emerging America, age and emerging Americas is the speed of change. Birth rates are falling everywhere, but in most of Asia, they are falling very fast. The countries are aging very fast. In the Americas, they are falling at a slow rate. You age, but you age at a slow pace. <clears throat> Number of medical level workers remain pretty robust. Okay. <clears throat> this is what I talked about. Okay. Changes that are taking place in marriage and divorce throughout Asia, right? Not just China. It's also Japan, South Korea, Southern India, and so on. Okay? Everybody talks about the emergence of the Asian consumer and the importance that that will play for companies, either international companies or companies there, whatever. What no one seems to recognize, however, is that many of the new consumers going forward will be different from the past. Historically, marriage and childbearing have been universal. So the basic consumer unit in Asia was a married couple of children. Now it's single people. They behave differently. They don't spend on the same things. And that's a key point to remember. Because all kinds of companies will say, hey, this is wonderful. Look at all these, you know, <clears throat> people aging and aging and growth and so on. And the question you should ask is, does marital status make a difference? Does presence of children make a difference? People who are not married, or especially people who don't have children, they travel. If you have children, you don't travel. Okay, last point, <clears throat> important change. What, is, what, are, what are the low interest rates do? They shift purchasing power across generations, <laughs> from those who have saved to those who borrow, from the old to the young. <clears throat> and that's the last point. <clears throat> so the context issue here, what each of us in this room tries to do, or has done, or contemplates doing, is provide a better standard of living for our children than what we grew up with. Do better than your parents. The only way the average baby boomer could accomplish that goal, both of us and my parents work, they didn't have a choice. So these are basically baby boomers. They grew very fast in the 70s and 80s, and then they basically have not grown much since. Generations X and Y took a choice. 10 million women, most spouses, most of the women have exited the US workforce over the last 15 years and come back home. You will never read about it in the press because it is politically incorrect to talk about women folding work around the family. It's the ability to have a rising standard of living on one paycheck. And it's not because the wage of the partner goes up so fast, that's what those wages buy. They buy housing, which has become more affordable, and they buy goods, which are falling in price. So what does this do? This trend drives a huge nail in the coffin of inflation. Baby boomers are relatively less sensitive to the higher prices. They have more money than time. They can't do a lot of comparison shopping and spend time. 
in the midst of assault civilization every day. It's why our companies complain about the difficulty they have in raising prices, because you're trying to make that one big check stretch through. Two other conclusions that come from this, and then I'll take questions. First is, this bifurcates the retail markets. It squeezes the middle. I have two, group, two types of consumers. I have baby boomers with money. They are mainly buying experiences. But to the extent that they buy goods, it's a better quality trade. The kids have left the house, now we can get good furniture. But make sure they left first, right? You don't go to Sears. It's not luxury goods. It's a much broader issue than that. It's simply better quality. And what does this group do? You go to the company with the lowest possible markup. Walmart, Costco, Texas. That's going to sell It doesn't mean you buy cheap. You buy brand names, but if you're going to charge more, there better be a real difference in quality. And the last point is, what does this do to the distribution of income? It makes it look more uneven. Because we measure it in terms of total household money income. And total household money income falls if one spouse comes in their home. They do it for quality reasons. I mean, the context issue here for the average second paycheck in a household is 85% of that paycheck goes to support the job of their children. There's taxes, wardrobe, childcare costs, and so on. In the 80s, that 15% was needed. Since then, it is largely discretionary. It's folding work for the family. So, in conclusion, the big challenge here is dealing in a world of very low interest rates. It's also good news for the Treasury. It's why we will avoid what the Grace Commission also laid out in 1986. You know, if America goes out on the hand basket. It didn't happen then, it won't happen now. Good news is, that's the difficult news. Low interest rates, low, low returns. Good news is, it's a rise in the standard of living for my children and my grandchildren. And that's a pretty good outcome. Thank you. Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam, shipped back to China. 
So does China become more warlike? Alternatively, there have been a couple of studies that he's done by American Enterprise Institute that basically say countries only go to war if they have surplus funds they can afford to lose. Which they don't have. So it's an interesting issue. Yes, sir. Now, Richard, your optimism about the U.S. reflects the growing numbers from immigration. But uh, the situation we saw this morning, a lot of the growth in the U.S. population is an elderly population. A lot of the growth is going to be the Hispanic population. Uh, and there's still a quite substantial slowdown in the labor force, even though there's still growth. Given our politics, given our excessive spending, and the fact that we're going into this situation at very high debt levels, do any of those temper your optimism? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, the question I asked before, I think, of Peter, is how do people identify themselves, right? I mean, the headline out of you know, the latest update for, on the Census Bureau forecast, you know, 49% of the U.S. population in 2050 is white and non-Hispanic. But 80% of the population is still sort of white. And the issue, you know, and Peter makes a very important point, how do people identify themselves? If they identify themselves as Americans, we're golden. Right? That's not true in Europe. If you ask somebody, who are you? It's very often a religious, right? I'm Muslim. I'm Catholic. Or whatever. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's sort of a very different issue. And I'm not, I mean, I'm not a, a Pollyanna about America. I know there's, I'm, I'm aware of problems in terms of educational achievement and so on. And it, you know, there are too many kids that don't get a good enough education. I realize that. I think we have a hell of a lot going for us. Although it's George Stratford, who put something more remarked, you know, part of our greatness is because we don't think we're great. We keep kicking ourselves in the ass. <laughs> so it's a question. Yes. You showed a uh, relationship between um, the, the tax rates on capital gains and the age distribution of the population, uh, basically as the uh, population age that uh, tax rates and capital gains went down. Um, on the other hand, you're suggesting that low interest rates are the revenge of the young on the whole. Uh, so uh, with, that, with that kind of baseline, what are the implications of the large fiscal deficit is a consequence of the old and the spending on health care. Is that the revenge of the old and the young's revenge on the old? <laughs> I do worry about health care. I mean, if you look at health care, health care inflation versus total inflation, from 1913 to 1945, it fell less. Health care inflation was less than overall, when people basically bought health, health care out of pocket. 1945 is the inflection point we're off to the races. What happened in 1945 was the following. The U.S. is making the transition from a wartime to a peacetime economy. It's an incredible shortage of workers because they're still overseas. What would companies do? Normally they would you know, raise wages to attract workers. Government says you can't do that, that's inflation. So what do they hit on? Employer-sponsored health care. The problem was, it was not a taxable benefit to the employee. It's free, okay? Guess what? If it's free, I will never be an informed consumer. I have no incentive to be an informed consumer if it's free. And that's the battle we've had now for more than 70 years. So that's, you know, that's the issue. You know. <clears throat> but you got, and somehow we've got to break with health care. You know, that's, that's the problem. And yes, low interest rates are the revenge of the young. Because they weren't out there on the But those interest rates are going to have to go up if we're going to pay for health care for the old. That's why I say it's the revenge of um, the old, the revenge of the young, the revenge of the old. Well, we'll see. I mean, you, you remember the Grace Commission? Yeah. yeah. I mean, they also talked about interest rates that could only go up. And they kept falling. We'll, we'll see. And you spoke about uh, spending. saying, um, you will print, but they can't make you spend the same amount. So where does print printing stop? Who prints first? At what point um, will it get excessive? 100% of GDP, 150% of GDP, the net portion in the US. Uh, 
Thank you very much. 